Hey, Infinite Masters, welcome to the Infinite Mastery Podcast, where every single week we bring you a high-performing, world-class leader or expert that will help you master your self-esteem and master your life. My name is Richard Quo, and I'll be your host today. Today we have Dee Hankins, which, who is a very successful motivational slash inspirational speaker that travels all around the United States, and he's has a really powerful story and I want to get him on so he can kind of share with you how do we leverage our adversities, our challenges that we have in our lives and really utilize that to our advantage and really make the most of those opportunities that really seem hard to deal with. In this uh, interview today, you will hear more about his story and also just how to just really flex those muscles for yourself and get through those challenging situations, all right? I hope you enjoy this and because this is one of my first uh, interviews I'm, I'm doing, what I'm going to request of you is as you are watching and looking at this interview, uh, give me some feedback on how I can improve it because this is just the beginning of our journey and every single step of the way we're going to improve. Okay. So thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy this conversation that we have. What's going on everyone. It's Richard. I got my friend D here. He is a world renowned inspirational speaker. He travels around everywhere to give his uh, amazing talk and a really good friend of mine. Super excited to to just chat with him today, chill on his uh, on his casting couch. Um, I'm in his, his couch with uh, red drapes. Um, don't look too much into that. Okay. Anyway, so today what we're gonna do is uh, I want to I want to bring Dion because he has like a really powerful story. So I want him to kind of share his story and um, just such a powerful story of just uh, going through the foster system and uh, just overcome the struggle. So. Uh, D, the first thing I want to ask is, uh, how would you introduce yourself? Man, I, uh, it's a funny story. So I was trying to figure out a perfect way to, you know, introduce myself. Mm. You know, when I speak and when I travel, when I come across people. And one day I get this Instagram notification and so I open it up, pop up my phone, open it up, and this this student that I had spoke to had, um, you know, tagged me under this quote that read, "One of the most amazing things that can happen is finding someone who sees everything you are and won't let you be anything less. They see the potential of mm. you. They see anything. They see endless possibilities." Mm. And through their eyes, you start to see yourself the same way yeah. as someone who matters, as someone who can make a difference in this world. And so, you know, she had put, this is what you did for me. Hmm. And so now when I introduced myself, I introduced myself as someone who, someone who believes you matter and someone who believes you can make a difference in this world. You know, honestly, I'm just a regular dude with an interesting story and I love sharing it with other people with the hope that it changes their perspective. Awesome, man. Cool. Thank you. That's that's a great way to introduce yourselves. You know, I think (laughs) oftentimes we, we introduce ourselves with like a title, like yeah. inspirational speaker or world renowned. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's talk about, um, I, I want to hear a little bit about your story. Like what was the biggest challenge you had growing up? And kind of like walk us through like uh, maybe like five minutes, like just kind of walk us through what were, what was like that big challenge and walk us through that moment. And what, what was that like? Well, you know what? I spent 18 years of my life in foster care. From two months old all the way to, you know, 18 years old when I emancipated at that time. I was in 12 different foster homes and two different group homes by the time I was 12. Uh, and it was difficult because, one, I didn't know my dad. Yeah. I didn't know my mom at that time either. So all these people, all these different, you know, families that I was in, all these different homes I was in, it... You're, it feels like the roof, or excuse me, the, the floor from under you is, is just falling apart. Mm. You know, you're in one home. I was literally in one home for four years of my life. And then because back then they felt like it was better for a young African-American male mm. to be raised by African-American parents. Yeah. That they took me away from this mm. home that I knew for just four years is the yeah. only thing that I knew. And then you go to another home and the system doesn't tell you at four years old that, yo, this is how the system works. Yeah. You have temporary foster homes and then we try to find you a permanent home. Yeah. So I just kept bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. And every time you do that, I mean, if you think about a ball, you know, every time you bounce a ball on mm. the ground, it's going to collect some dirt. Yeah. You know, it's going to yep. collect some dirt. It's going to start doing some some wear and tear. And eventually, 12 homes later, 
you know, how much dirt and baggage mm-hmm. and anger and things I collected. So it was difficult for me to navigate through the system yeah. and try to have a normal life, try to fit in. I used to lie about being mm-hmm. in foster care. You know, I used to, every foster brother I had or family, I was all same mom, different dad, you know, yeah. just so I didn't seem different. So I struggled with that as well. Hmm. What was the, what was that like, what is one, one moment that was like really challenging? Like if you were to just place this back in that moment, what, what did that look like? I think it came when I was eight years old. I had moved from this home that I thought was going to be my home. Yeah. And they took me out. How long were you there? I was there for maybe six months. You know, maybe six months. And I thought this was going to be my home. And as soon as they took me away, the eight years prior start to spring up. Mm. And that's when I started. I was acting out. You know what I'm saying? I was just, I was, I was angry. And at eight years old, you don't really know how to communicate your anger. Yeah. So you act out, you wild out. And I was wilding out at eight years old, stealing stuff, you know, cussing, fighting, um, you know, have trouble with authority, all that, man. Before I got there, I was literally just taken from a foster home. Hmm. And I thought to myself, okay, every time I get into a foster home and they tell me that they love me and I tell them that I love them and they call me son and I call mom and dad. Every time I do that, they've moved me thus Hmm. far. So I'm in the back of my social worker's car, little, you know, Honda Civic, Mm -hmm. right? And we're driving down and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to this new home. Now, everything that I've done, the I love yous, the behave, all that, that has been wrong. Mm. Because every time I do that, they move me. Yeah. So in order for me to stay, I'd have to do the exact opposite. Hmm. You know, that's, I mean, that's my logical thinking level. This was wrong. So this has to be right in order for me to have that stability yeah. in order for me to have that family in order for me to you know sell people to celebrate my birthday or to have christmas presents and my family come from different states all on thanksgiving to eat food yeah. you know or my dad to be pushing me in that swing at the park those are the things that i wanted yeah and i couldn't get those things because i was telling these people that i love them yeah and then i was behaving so i went to this new home and i was like you know what i'm ready yeah. I know exactly what to do now. Hmm. So I got to this new home and over time they're like, oh, we love you. Well, I hate you. Come mm-hmm. down for dinner. No. Hold wow. my hand. No. Behave. No. Wow. You know, being mad disrespectful and in foster care, that doesn't fly very hmm. well. So next thing you know, I come home one day, my stuff is packed wow. and I'm moving again. Wow. And it felt like, yo, this wasn't the right way. Hmm. This wasn't the right way. So it was at that time where I fell into the state of hopelessness, you know, something I talk about. And I just didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel, man. And, you know, eight years old, you don't really know what suicide is, especially back then in the Hmm. 90s. So I was just wilding out, cussing out my teachers, fighting every day. I'm talking elementary school, you know. And so though that was my trigger, that was the thing that really broke me Hmm. the the most. What, what, What kept you going? I mean, you went through a lot. I did, man. I had a vice principal at my elementary school that kind of sat me down one day. And I was literally in her office um, every single day, right? Every single day in elementary school, you know, in trouble. And she sat me in her office. And one day I just, you know, I blew up in class, cussed out my teacher, was fighting everybody, you know. And I had went to the office and she had sat me down in the same chair that she sat me down every single day. Yeah. And this particular day, I was thinking, I don't want to be here. Mm -hmm. They don't want me here. I'm in trouble every day. Yeah. So I look at her. Why don't you just send me home? Hmm. And she walks up to me. She gets down at my level and she says, because you have potential. Blew my mind, man. Blew my mind. I had no clue what the heck she was talking about. I had no clue what potential meant. But now that I'm older, I I do. You know, what she was saying was, this kid, this little eight-year-old boy, he didn't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to be disrespectful. You know, that's a, he's a, something is going on in this kid's life to make him act like that. Yeah. And she saw past hmm. all the BS and saw this little eight year old boy that was crying out for help. Yeah. And what reiterated that I was 17, I was in high school. I went to Walnut, Cal- uh, Walnut high school and I got this call 
from this sponsorship program, United Friends of the Children in Los Angeles, and this lady named Monica, she called me and she said, yo, we want to offer you a scholarship to go to college. And I'm like, all right, cool. You know, I wasn't really thinking about college or anything like that. Um, I had run track and field and we had uh, had some all comers meets at Long Beach State. So I had, you know, that's the only experience I had with college. Yeah. I was a Bruins fan, you know, but I was thinking, yeah, I'm never getting into mm-hmm. UCLA, you know what I'm saying? Like, whatever. Yeah. So this lady, Monica, she called and she's talking about the program. And she's saying, yo, um, we have this to offer you. We'll give you $5,000 a year, a year uh, $3,000 a year for up to five years to go yeah. to college. So I'm like, all right, cool. And then as we were talking, literally my... My mannerisms were, okay, cool, yeah, I I was excited, you know? And then she said something. She said, yeah, yeah, we just want to help you. And no kidding, it was kind of like a movie flashback. Mm. You know, when somebody's about to die and they, Mm. like, think about all their life. That happened to me right then and there on the phone, yeah. like upstairs in my room, <laughs> because that was my trigger word. Right. You know, how many social workers told me that they just want to help me? How many wow. foster parents told me that they just want to help wow. me? How many teachers told me that they just want to help me? And I just literally went back to that eight-year-old boy. Wow. And I went from, uh-huh, okay, cool to, uh-huh, all right, all right, yeah, wow. whatever. Yeah. And for some reason, she said, yo, D, if this is something that you want, just give us a call back. And I was like, all right, yeah, whatever, click. Mm. So the very next day, I'm in my room doing my homework and my foster mom says yo d phone so i'm all right pick it up you know thinking it's a girlfriend or something yeah you know we all do that same thing <clears throat> hello this mike right <laughs> so i i say hello and this lady pops on the phone and i kid you not these next few words changed my life she said hey d this is monica we noticed you haven't called And if I can give you a visual representation of what went on that day, man, all my doubt, all my hate, all, all everything, my anger, everything melted away like, like that. It was on Mm. the floor. My life literally took a 180 Yeah. because this lady called me back. Yeah. Showed me that she cared. Yeah. My vice principal did the same thing. So here I am with two strangers in my life. Two strangers yeah. that showed me that they care about me. So yeah. my motto growing up, people don't care about you, so why care about people, mm. had to be false. Wow. It had mm. to be false, man. So people say, oh, you can't change overnight. Yeah, you can mm. with the right catalyst. That's how yeah. I. That's what I believe. And my life literally took a 180. My grades went up. I graduated Walnut with a you know 3.6 something mm-hmm. GPA, you know. I end up going to Long Beach despite the statistics. 50% of us drop out of high school, mm-hmm. right? We're 10 times more likely to end up in prison than we are to ever step foot on a college campus. Mm-hmm. You know, two, two to three, two to 4% of us actually graduate college. Yeah. So get this, because of that phone call, I graduated Walnut High School, May 2005. I started California State University, Long Beach, August 2005. Mm-hmm. And I graduated May 2009. That's how you get over things. Hmm. They gave me hope, man. Yeah. Plus, I got, you know, and even though I didn't have biological family, I had friend family. Yeah. You know, I had people who outside that cared about me enough to show me that I could do more, that I could be more, Hmm. that I am more. Hmm. And that's what I went for. Awesome, man. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to keep it real. We only got like two or three minutes left right right now. So thanks for sharing that. I mean, that's powerful. You know, I'm, uh, what I hear heard was, you know, sometimes it takes that little bit of, uh, support from others. And, you know, we don't always have that though. Yeah. You know, and, um, sometimes we get lucky. Sometimes we don't. What, what advice would you give to, you know, people watching this right now who are struggling to get that support because it, it doesn't always reach out to us. Right. And you know what? I I say this all the time. And for those of you watching right now, you have that support. It's just you're not comfortable enough to go out and get it. And it's going to come from strangers. It might come from people Mm -hmm. that you least expect it. Um, It might come from you might want it to come from the people closest to you. Your mom, your dad, your your family, your immediate family, uh, a best friend or something like that. But that might not be where it comes from. 
So you have to be able to be uncomfortable in order to have somebody step into your life and say, look, I see something in you because everyone has a different perspective of you. That vice principal saw something in me. This lady, Monica from United Friends of the Children, she saw something in me. Richard Parkhouse, who is my mentor, he saw something in me. And these are all strangers. These are all people that, you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't hang around with. They weren't, you know, like whatever. And on top of that, like, you know, your your friends, obviously, I got great, great friends. I have great friends and they will help you through your hard times. But you have to be able to be willing to accept that you have mm-hmm. to be. Bottom line is this. You got to be willing to be vulnerable and open up your heart and open up your chest so people can penetrate. That's it. Right on. Powerful. Thank you, man. Powerful. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to quickly recap that. So really important thing that I heard for myself was uh, support is always there. It's just sometimes we close ourselves off. Absolutely. Like we're not being vulnerable. We're we're like we're, we're holding on to whatever it is or trying to be right or our ego or whatever it is because we're thinking, what's the point? Yeah. And when we let ourselves go, when we open ourselves up, that's when support shows up in our life. Yeah. Yeah, we think, awesome. oh, you don't know me, yeah. right? So yep. you don't know what I'm going through, but you don't know that person. So how do you know? You know what I'm <laughs> right. saying? You got to open up. Absolutely. Awesome. So last thing I want to ask is uh, final thoughts, final uh, thoughts you have for people who are going through that tough time, who are having difficulty reaching out for support. What what other tip do you want to leave with them? No matter how hard life gets, you should never give up. Because if you think you can't, and you really can, you're going to miss that chance. All right. Thanks, man. All right, man. Appreciate you, bro. Absolutely. All right. There we go. We got D. Hankins here. Uh, (laughs) World-renowned inspirational speaker. That's it, man. uh, More importantly, the the catalyst. Thank you. To making uh, a lot of leveraging your story to uh, really make a difference and connect with people and help them understand that they can do it too. Absolutely. So thanks for doing that, man. Absolutely. Man. All right, man. Yeah. See you. Yeah. Peace out. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the infinite mastery podcast. If you did be sure to like it and share it with your friends. And also again, just a quick reminder, please drop a few lines of feedback as we are always trying to improve this. This is just our second episode. So there's so much more to be improved and I want to make sure that I'm here for you. Uh, lastly, please be sure to check us out and join our Facebook community. It's facebook.com slash groups slash infinite mastery. All right, check us out there. That's where the conversation is happening and uh, I'll catch you here next week. Take care.